When it comes to hair loss, it seems like everyone is an expert. Your friends, your grandmother, your parents, your favorite actor or actress, and the latest YouTube star. And of course, Google. And if you believe all those sources, you'll think that everything, or maybe nothing, is responsible for your hair loss. The problem is that 80% of both men and women will experience hair loss at some point. So yes, if you shampoo vigorously, you'll probably experience hair loss, just not because of the shampooing. In my practice, I hear just about everything every week and spend lots of time addressing the various myths surrounding the medical management of hair loss. To help us learn more about this topic, as usual, I invited the best of the best, Dr. Robert True. Hi, I'm Dr. Robert Haber, hair loss expert and hair transplant surgeon from Cleveland, Ohio. Join me and the Hair Transplant Roadshow as I travel the globe seeking answers to important surgical and non-surgical hair loss questions from the true experts in the field. So today, the Hair Transplant Roadshow was going to travel to my original hometown of New York City to visit with Dr. Robert True, but Bob is currently in Germany. So we changed our travel plans and, and we're heading to Germany. Bob is a true international expert, having delivered lectures on five of the world's seven continents. His early expertise was strip surgery, but he was an early adopter of the FUE technique and rapidly became a guru to surgeons interested in learning this technique. Bob is also well-versed in the non-surgical management of hair loss. Bob is a member of the ISHRS where he has reached fellow status. He is certified by the American Board of Hair Restoration Surgery. He was a winner of the Golden Follicle Award by the ISHRS, granted for clinical contributions in the field of hair restoration. He has served on the Board of Governors of the ISHRS and served for three years as editor of the Hair Transplant Forum, the major newsletter in our field. He's lectured extensively throughout the world, has contributed to multiple textbooks, and in 2021, authored one of the latest textbooks in our field, The Practical Guide to Hair Transplantation. Unfortunately, for the field of hair restoration, by the time this segment is available, Bob will have retired from active practice, <laughs> I'm sure to pursue other passions. So I'm fortunate that Bob agreed to spend a little time with me to discuss a topic he addressed regularly during his years of practice, common myths about the medical treatments for hair loss. Please help this program, of course, by selecting like and subscribe. Bob, what's your plan for retirement? Well, I, I have been involved with quite a few voluntary activities throughout my life, and I'm going to continue to do those, uh, working in uh, uh, climate issues, uh, social justice, uh, and uh, underserved populations. Those are the things that I'm interested in. Well, sounds like you're going to be busy, so uh, I'm a little jealous. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll see. How well, and I'm also I could last. enjoy my grandchildren and have a lot of fun. So, perfect. Yeah. So, Bob, what are the what are the, some of the most common myths you faced over the years, and how do we educate our patients regarding the truth? Yeah, I think I think this is really important as uh, hair transplant surgeons that we recognize that there's a lot of uh, misconceptions and preconceptions that patients have about medical therapy. And even though our focus is surgery, the vast majority of our patients, those that have male pattern hair loss, female pattern hair loss, surgery isn't the only answer. Medical therapy in combination with surgery is really the long-term answer for them. And so we have to be effective in prescribing for them. So first, let me talk about some common myths about minoxidil. Number one is that it works very quickly. Well, it really doesn't. And, and over and over again, when I see people in consults, that I'll say, Did, have you used uh, minoxidil? And they said, yeah, I tried it for a couple of weeks and it didn't do anything. And so I stopped. Well, of course, they need to understand that, first of all, it takes about six to eight weeks before we begin to see that the hair loss itself is beginning to taper off and not be at the same rate that it was. And then it takes about six months before we can see maybe some degree of recovery. So if patients don't use it that length of time, there's going to be a problem. So they have to understand the truth about that. Well, and of course, if, if, if the only thing we do for them is stop further loss, that's great too. If they don't lose any more hair, yeah. 
that's a huge, huge success. And people don't realize that that's, that's a benefit. We don't have to grow the hair back to have success with medical management. That's right. And, and a lot of people will use over-the-counter Rogaine thinking that it's going to reverse what's happened. And that can happen for some people. But the main reason that they're using it and should understand is to keep it from getting worse. And so we have to address that for them. So uh, the, the next thing, a, a myth about minoxidil is that it only works in the vertex. I hear this all the time. You know, say, are you using minoxidil? And no, I'm not, because it only works for balding in the vertex. And the reason that that myth has popped up is that in the patient prescribing information or package insert that comes with the medication when you buy it, it says that it's proven to work in the vertex. And that was based on the studies that were originally submitted for its approval. So that's the only thing they can claim on that. But there have been many studies subsequently have, that have shown that Noxidil can be effective all over the top of the head. So we really have to make that clear to patients that it can be effective if they apply it in the front and the mid scalp as well as the vertex area. I think that's, that's, that's a great point. And people ask me, well, why don't they just get approval for the front as well? Uh, and they don't realize that to, to get a new indication like that would cost whoever would try to get that, that approval would cost between two and three hundred million dollars in clinical trial expenses to get the FDA to agree to, to say that new area. So no one wants to spend that kind of money. Right. We'll get it approved in one area, but they'll, they'll apply it everywhere else. Yeah. So, so the fact that many people misunderstand that is we can understand how that's happening. And if we don't recognize it and explain it to our patients, they're probably not going to have that information. So it's important to do this in the consultation. Um, now, and uh, another common myth about minoxidil uh, is that it uh, worsens hair loss. And uh, the truth of the matter is that there can be an increased shed in the first few weeks of use, but long term, it's not going to worsen the hair loss. Uh, and so we need to make that clear to patients that they may see an increased shed in the beginning. Ignore that. By about six to eight weeks, that should begin to taper off, and then the effect should be there. Uh, and sometimes patients will say, well, I'm not going to use Rogaine because it, it affects your libido and erection. And that myth is just pure crossover confusion with our friend finasteride. So the most common myth about finasteride is that it's a very, very high risk for side effects. And that's simply not true. There are side effects that can happen, but that basically involves maybe five, maybe three or four percent of patients will have side effects. So the vast majority of people who use finasteride won't have side effects. And then another common myth about finasteride is that it may cause permanent infertility. Well, finasteride does lower the sperm count. Uh, that's, a, that's a temporary effect. So if you're taking finasteride, your sperm count will be lower than it is if you're not taking it. But if you stop the finasteride, the sperm count will come up. And that degree of sperm count reduction is, is for the vast majority of men, not sufficient to affect their fertility. But if a, if a man has a pre-existing low sperm count, that could tip them into a level where they're, it's affecting their fertility. But if the medication is stopped at that point, the sperm count will go back up to whatever level it was before. So that's, that's an, another important thing to address. And, and a, big problem, a big problem is that some of these issues are very common amongst men. So we know that sexual dysfunction is incredibly uh, common amongst men of all ages in every country in the world. Correct. And of course, if that happens, you want to blame it on something. So, you know, a study that I published a couple of years ago looked at a, a large group of men and found that the incidence of sexual dysfunction was no different between men taking Propecia and men not taking Propecia. Mm -hmm. We found a lot of it, but there was no difference between those two groups, which is not to say that it can't cause it. Yes. It's just the vast majority of sexual dysfunction is just there. It's background. Something's causing it, but probably not the finasteride. Very, yeah. very important points. Yeah. yeah. Another myth that was uh, 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 very important was that, that, that finasteride caused prostate cancer. So there was a study that suggested this. So what was it, 15 years ago or something like that? And subsequent studies have refuted that, that it was really 
just a relative change in terms of high level cancers versus low level cancers. And so there really isn't a need to be concerned about prostate cancer arising because you're taking finasteride. Um, then uh, another one is that uh, you can have a deformed baby. This is something that people hear. If I'm taking finasteride, we could have a deformed baby. And of course, that's very intimidating. But the truth of the matter is that there's no evidence to support that if a man is taking finasteride, that that increases at any risk of having a, a baby with any deformities. On the other hand, if a woman is pregnant and she is taking finasteride, then there can be uh, de deformities that arise during pregnancy. And if you read the prescribing information, it'll say that women shouldn't even touch the pills. I don't know why women are going around touching their husband's pills anyway, but the whole idea there is, for example, if a woman pharmacist is sorting pills and touching these pills quite a bit, she could actually be exposed to a significant dosage. So it's, it's, it's said that, that she shouldn't do that. But the the real and, and that's and that's and that's the cr crushed or broken tablets. The the, the intact yeah. tablets are coated and, right. and perfectly safe, and the amount that you could potentially absorb. Again, I think that's being super super cautious, and certainly a woman who's pregnant or intended to become pregnant should not take finasteride. But as you were saying, there's just just not enough finasteride delivered in right. in semen to cause a problem. And then very importantly, because between both forms of finasteride. Propecia and, and Proscar, it's been around for 25 years at least. There's never once anywhere in the world been a, you know, a Propecia baby been born anywhere. Right. Uh, or, or any cancers that have been legitimately associated with finasteride. So all reasonable concerns, but we would have seen that somewhere along the way. It's, it's never happened. There's no such thing as a finasteride baby. Correct. Correct. Then there also is this myth that if you take finasteride, you may, and, and you have side effects, those side effects may never go away when you stop the medication. And this is referred to as post-finasteride syndrome. And people read about that and it's very intimidating and it frightens them and, and tends to make them stay away from the medication. Post-finasteride syndrome is very problematic. We could spend a whole issue of your uh, podcast just talking about that. And we don't have enough time to really do it today. But but my take on it is that the evidence supporting it as a real syndrome is really not great scientific evidence. There's a lot of uh, bias in the studies that are being done, and there's not really good comparisons and controls and, and all of that sort of thing. And I have never seen a case in my own practice having prescribed th to thousands of patients I know, I know they're out there, and I know some people believe it, but I tell patients that, in my experience, the side effects are reversible, and, uh, and I find that that's been true. I certainly have had patients who've had side effects, but we've stopped the medications, and, and those side effects have gone away invariably. I, I agree. I have, I've had the same experience. And then getting back to the study that I published, I was surprised, but... 14% in the youngest age group that we looked at between 18 and 29, 14% reported some kind of sexual dysfunction. Again, that was finasteride users and not users. 14% of that age group reporting sexual dysfunction to me was, wow, that's an incredible number in that age. So that's, that's not having anything to do with medication. So Sexual dysfunction and, and permanent impotence is a problem that men experience, and an unfortunately large number of men will experience that. Again, no evidence, in my opinion, that finasteride is doing it. I agree. So I think I've covered most of the myths that I wanted to do. I guess maybe one final one that I would do is that, uh, and this is true, a myth about both finasteride and minoxidil, and that is that if you stop, if you've been using it and you stop, you're going to end up being much bolder than you would be if you'd never started it. And that's, that's just not true. Of course, if you, you stop it, then you're going to start to lose hair again. And that the rate of that resumption can vary from individual to individual. But at the end point, the person will end up at the level of baldness that they would have been 
it if they had never used anything. Very good. In other words, they're not paying a penalty right. for using the medication. Correct. And people really have to stand. I think it's a hugely important yeah. point. It's, it's so difficult for us sometimes to get patients to start medications. Yes. And uh, we're doing that in their best interest because we want to help them hold on to the hair they have. Yes, of course, we're hair surgeons and we want to we want to do hair surgery, but we also are, are doctors that want to help prevent the problem from getting worse. And the only two FDA-approved medications to do that are minoxidil and finasteride. And we really encourage patients to use that. Right. So I think I've kind of covered the bases of what I wanted to talk about in this subject. Do you have any other questions related to this? Sure. What about, people are also very concerned with minoxidil about you know, growing unwanted hair everywhere. That's not really a myth, but I don't find it to be super common. What's your experience with minoxidil, whether topical or oral, with, uh, with causing unwanted hair growth? I've seen it. I've seen it in a couple of women, uh, but it hasn't been a major issue. I, for, for, for neither one of them did they want to stop or reduce the dosage. Uh, but they did, had noticed, and I could see it, that there was some increase in facial hair. I think theoretically this would be more likely to occur if someone was taking oral minoxidil. And I, I have quite a bit of experience with more oral minoxidil, and I haven't seen that as yet. But I'm using low dosages, you know, uh, uh, 1.25 to 2.5, occasionally 5. I'm, I'm at low doses. I think with higher doses, maybe it could be. You know, it's interesting. Uh, I use a lot of low-dose oral minoxidil as well. And I find unwanted hair growth uncommon with both topical and oral. But I see it more often with the topical than I do with the oral, which makes no sense. Okay. But I get better clinical results with hair growth and less unwanted hair growth. Uh -huh. And, of course, if we get it, I'll, I say... You know, you have to make a decision. We can stop the medication, but you'll, you'll lose the hair you want, or we can do a number of different things to get rid of the hair that you don't want, which is what yep. most people end up doing. Yes. Yeah. yeah. 